Hi. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for making it early in the morning for Grand Rounds. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome Dr. Wiley's son, who flew 2,500 miles today to give us this talk. Um, so she's the director of Leukemia and Lymphoma at City of Hope. Um, I've known her for six years now, uh, but I call, she's my life mentor, learned a lot from her. Um, so just briefly a little bit about her. Um, she did her PhD at the University of Tennessee at St. Jude's Hospital. Um, did her medical um, school in China, I'm gonna get this right, at Sun Yat-sen. Uh, and completed her pediatric residency at the Sinai Hospital of Baltimore um, and finished up her training at the Montefiore Medical Center, then went to Memorial Sloan Kettering to finish up her fellowship, was at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles for a long time and is now at City of Hope. Um, leads, um, is a, a principal investigator and leader of a multiple phase one clinical trials in um, relapsed leukemia. Um, and has had multiple uh, peer-reviewed published articles. And I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Sun. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? It's a great pleasure to come here. Actually, I came to Orlando many, many years ago went to the Universal Studio. So I actually got a chance to uh, visit Disneyland. It was, it was fun. That Disney World, it was fun. So much better than the one they had in LA. Um, so today I'm just going to, uh, rather than my usual talk, mostly focus on my research, I figure the audience, we have a lot of residents here. So I want to kind of give a general talk about the kind of history of pediatric um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia and uh, uh, what's our current treatment and uh, then I will lead to some new therapies that's probably going to change how we treat the ALL in the next couple of years and talking about some challenges. Uh, let me see. Okay, so I have nothing to disclosure, but I, I'm going to talk about some investigational uh, drugs that has not approved. And so, so the history of leukemia. I made this slide. I'm, I'm thinking make it very simple. And uh, to me, the leukemia really was um, has existed for a very, very long time. But it was first described by Dr. Virchow um, about um, 250 years ago about the patient that who had the leukemia. And then up to uh, 100 years later, uh, to me is uh, Dr. Sidney Farber, who actually is part of the was at Boston Children's, who was a pathologist. And he's the one actually discovered the first chemotherapy medication called methotrexate. So he actually was the, called the father of chemotherapy. I think since then, uh, things actually changed a lot. Before, leukemia was a lethal disease. And uh, uh, since the discovery of methotrexate, we were able to start to cure some children with leukemia. And uh, 10 years later, uh, Dr. Donald Thomas, who actually built the uh, Seattle uh, institution, actually di uh, discovered how to do hematopoietic stem cell transplant that were able to further cure uh, more, uh, more children with leukemia. Then fast forward to uh, 2013, the first uh, paper was published uh, for the CAR T-cell therapy. And in fact, this CAR T-cell therapy was being approved by the FDA last year. I think, again, it's going to completely change how we're going to treat the leukemia in the next couple of years. I'm going to skip the transplants because my focus is really the chemotherapy, a uh, new drug therapy. And so transplants is really, I'm not going to talk about it. So go back a little bit history. Uh, why I think, um, I highlight Dr. Farber because I think it's a very, very uh, interesting and intrigue story um, how he discovered the methotrexate. And so he actually is not an oncologist. He's a pathologist. He was in his basement trying to figure out why patients got leukemia, how to treat them, especially for children. He was at Boston Children's Hospital at that time. And the being, you guys all know, for children who got leukemia, they can have anemia, they can have bleeding, and many symptoms actually uh, mimic a patient who had megaloblastic anemia. So megaloblastic anemia, a lot of time, is because they have folate deficiency. So for Dr. Farber decided, okay, if they have anemia, you know, maybe I give them folate that the, kid, the kids can get better. So that's what he did. Uh, again, that time there's no IRB, no clinical trial protocol. He just decided to give a bunch of kids folate. Uh, guess what happened? So the kids actually, not only they didn't get better, actually the kids died quicker. Uh, now we learn actually the uh, ALL cells like folate as a fuel to divide, uh, to, to divide. So that's why kids died quicker. Um, well, that's not the only story. To me, I think what's intriguing is 
If it were me or many other people, they'll be so discouraged that I make my patient worse. They're going to stop. And indeed, he stopped. But being a smart people like him, he's like, okay, if the folate make patients die quicker, the disease worse, how about I do anti-folate? Is that going to make them better? So he actually teamed up with um, a chemist, uh, hence developed uh, the methotrexate. Uh, indeed, when the methotrexate was developed, again, he gave to the patient, actually some patients got into a complete remission. So that is the first uh, development of the chemotherapy drug. And then eventually we learned how to use chemotherapy. So this, I highlighted the patient actually was made to the, uh, the radio and newspaper a lot of time at that time. This, this patient is called Anna Gustafsson. I don't really know how to spell the last name. And he actually was the first person that's ever been uh, kind of publicized, first children that was cured uh, with leukemia using some combination of chemotherapy, mainly will be the methotrexate. And the, the, he was named after Jimmy. Uh, in fact, Dana Farber has uh, Jimmy's fans. They are still everywhere. And this is Jimmy when he's old with his two grandchildren. So that's actually really highlight how the, uh, the scientists, the physicians in our previous generation, how they were actually thinking out of the box and uh, not be discouraged by the failures encountered when we treat the patients and to uh, come to our own today's success. So here's where we are today. So this is our ALL. So this is actually data from Children's Oncology Group. And we're looking at the survival. So we're looking at survival versus the year. As you can see that back in the 60s, almost all the children died. A few people survived, including Jimmy. And then we actually decided to do our um, clinical trials to put everybody on the same protocol. And we learn from our mistakes, and we actually um, continue improvement. Currently, till to year, two, I think it's 2000, our overall survival for acute lymphoblast leukemia is actually reaching 90%, which is a huge success. One thing with AML, which is the less common childhood leukemia, again, you see a steady improvement of survival. The survival of AML is a little bit less uh, now, but currently it's about 70%, which again is a huge success compared with uh, you know, single digits about 50 or 60 years ago. Okay, so uh, since we have some pediatric residents here, so I'm just going to start with a case scenario, which is very, very common. So you're in the ER, and uh, there's a two-year-old boy, and uh, a previous healthy, come in for a leg pain for about three weeks, has some intermittent fever. There's no history of trauma. And uh, you look at the patient, it was very irritable, refused to work. You decide to do a chest x-ray and a CBC and send a blood culture. And then the lab called you 10 minutes later, said with a panic uh, lab. So this is what, what you have. And then what are you going to do next? Do we have some resident here? Oh, yeah. What are you going to do next? Um, when I gave this case scenario in the CHLA, they told me call him monk. Um, so that, that, that's, yeah, that's the, not a, yeah, that's the right answer. But what else will you do? Who's a he monk right now? And so I heard the LDH Eureka, I said, okay. A peripheral blood smear. Uh, peripheral breast smear, okay. Start antibiotics. Start antibiotics, okay. Get fluid. Get fluid, yes, yes. So we're talking about, we worry about tumor lysis syndrome, that's why you check uric acid and the LDH. You worry about sepsis because you have fever, antibiotics, and you do peripheral smear, figure out what kind of blast looks like. Yeah, perfect. So that's what, what you do, but again, first you go back to do a good physical exam. Just make sure, uh, you know, there's no pathological fracture, uh, no uh, huge leaf and spleen you might miss the first time, and testicular cancer. You send more lab tests, and uh, you probably would do a chest x-ray, because some kids may have mediastinal mass. So then, th this is the, the, the result. And uh, what you immediately see, the uric acid was a little bit elevated, uh, the edge was elevated, everything else actually doesn't look too bad. Um, again, as a resident, then the kids will be onto the floor, we'll do antibiotics, we'll do fluids. But as a resident, I think I always tell my residents, the most important thing for you is to keep the patient alive. Make sure they don't die uh, overnight. Uh, make sure if they need to go to ICU, you send them to ICU before they, they crush. So then what you need to do is you really need to think, anticipate what things can go wrong. The patient looks fine now, but what can go wrong in the next couple of hours? So you can anticipate and you can prevent those. So we've talked a uh, bunch of things. Things can go wrong will be sepsis. 
you need to watch the tumor lysis syndrome, check labs, make sure they have good urine outputs. And sometimes they can have respiratory distress. And those can uh, happen, especially if a patient has mediastinal mass or they have very, very high uh, white counts. They can have uh, leukocytosis and hypoleukocytosis. And some patients can have DIC more in like AML patients. So those are the things I think as a <coughs> resident, uh, it doesn't matter if you're interested in him or not. When you're on call, you've got to make sure those things you have that in your mind, and then you can act uh, very quickly. Okay, so the next day, the hemon comes and, okay, we'll do the bone marrow aspiration, we'll do biopsy, and we'll do lumbar puncture, we'll put a line, we'll do echo, and we'll do chemo. <clears throat> but do you guys exactly know what, what we do with this? I think it will be a, a good overview for our resident to kind of know exactly how we made the diagnosis of leukemia, exactly what we do with this bone marrow, and how we treat them, kind of evaluate the disease. So the first thing for the bone marrow, of course, morphology, everybody knows. You do a smear, you look under the microscope, you figure out if it's lymphoblast or myeloblast. Uh, often it was successful, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes it's hard to know if they're lymphoblast or myeloblast. Then we need some other tools. So the first thing I'll talk about is we were going to do something called um, uh, immunophenotyping, also called flow cytometry. Have you guys heard about flow cytometry? Okay, perfect, great. So overview, you have all the CD markers, they are the antigens expressed on the normal cells. Minor cells express panel of markers, they're different from B and T. And uh, so the way we can do it is we actually using antibody conjugated with the fluorocomb and make a single cell suspension go through this machine. You have a laser light coming over. And if there's antibody binds to this antigen, they're going to absorb the light and emit uh, a light at different wavelength. So that's how you'll be able to tell this uh, cell has this antibody. So at the end of the day, you know, that's how they run. If a cell is positive for a particularly antigen, you're going to have a wave is here compared with negative control. So that's how we can tell if this cell is a B cell or a T cell or a myeloid lineage. And then you can do only single color flow, which means only put one antibody binds to one cell, or you can do multi-color flow. You can put different antibodies who has different fluorocomb conjugated to do multi-color flow to see what kind of combination of markers expressed on the cell. So that's how we actually do, do based on the minimal residue disease detection I'll talk about later. So you do flow cytometry, those should, the results should come back you know, reasonably within a couple of hours, sometime a day. Then you will be able to know what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with a myeloid or lymphoid, if it's a T or B cells. And then <coughs> the cytogenetic is something also we do. And the, what cytogenetics is actually a two test. One is called a fish fluorescent in situ hybridization. The other is karyotype. So what FISH is, is um, we learned through the years, leukemia cells, they actually they have the changes in the chromosome. Often they can have recurrent chromosome breakdown. So you, you guys have done the HEMAC, you probably heard we talk about tau AML1 translocation, Philadelphia chromosome. What happens is part of the chromosome will break and translocate different chromosome. They always break at the same point. So that's why people can make some fluorescent probe. They will hybridize to the break point. And if you see, this is a normal cells. I don't know if you guys can see or not. You, you, you have a, um, a green dot here and a red dot here. So those normal cells, they have two signals. You see two green dots, two red dots. That's normal. But if you have a chromosome breakage here, you will be able to take my word. If you can't see it, you will see the red and the green hybridized together, suggesting there's a fusion protein. So part of them is from a chromosome, let's say, 9. The others from chromosome 22. They hybridize together. So you got an abnormal signal right over here. Then you'll be able to know, OK, this cell has a recurrent chromosome translocation. But fish, again, fish come back relatively quick. About a day or two, you will know what you're dealing with. And then the second one is called karyotype. What we do is we took those bone marrow cells, we put in a petri dish, let them grow. So when they grow, they go to mitosis. And if you remember what you learned in your pre-med school, when the cell goes to mitosis, all the chromosomes become condensed. Then you lyse the cells. You'll be able to align the chromosomes um, like this. And then you'll be able to tell if they have abnormal chromosomes here. So this is a very, very typical of a pre-B ALL trans, uh, patients that you can see. You'll see they have three copies of chromosome 4, and three copies of chromosome 6, and three copies of chromosome 17, 18. So this is called hyperdiploid, which means they have more than 46 chromosomes. 
And uh, by doing those kind of cytogenetics, we actually was able to further divide the ALL into further subclassification. Uh, so for the B cells, we see a lot of hyperdeployed phenotype, which is kind of like what you're going to see here. Some of them will have tel ml one translocation. So the question is, why, why we do this? Is it because we can or is it because we want to do, have fun? Um, actually, it's, it's not only that. It's more importantly, is we actually know that for um, leukemias, if they have different chromosome translocation or cytogenetics, the outcome are very different. And what I'm showing here, for example, for a patient with hyperdeployed tel ml one they actually do very, very well. For the, for the patient who have like ML translocation or BCR able, they do a lot worse. You see the difference, which is 80% versus 20%. And so that's how we would know within first week of diagnosis, we, we kind of know if the patient's going to do well or some patient will may do worse. And then, so for the people who are in the research field, what we are focusing on will be how I can improve those patients who we know they're going to do bad. And, um, and then make them uh, get a better survival. How about for those patients who we know they respond to chemotherapy very well, is they able for us to pull back some of the chemotherapy, decrease the toxicities, and make them have same good event-free survival. So that's what we are working on. Okay. So then we know, you know, within the first couple of days, we know, you know, if they are if they're the T or B cells, and we can start treatment. And uh, uh, so after treatment, we, we call it induction, which is the first cycle of chemotherapy. Afterwards, we, uh, we say, okay, we'll do a disease evaluation. So here's how, what we do. Again, we will do another bone marrow. Usually for the ALL, we do the about in four weeks. We'll do looking for morphology to see if they're into complete remission or not, which means less than 5% of blood in the bone marrow. And then we also do something called MRD, minimum residue disease. I uh, don't know if you guys, rotate the monk, have heard us talking about this or not. So this actually is a much more sensitive method than the morphology. The way I tell my patient is, you know, 5% is good, but our eyes can be deceiving. Sometimes it can be difficult for me to tell if it's a leukemia versus a normal cells. But the uh, uh, MRD, they can use, we can use a flow cytometry method, again, like I talked to you before, and it's looking for less than 0.01% of minimal residue disease, which is a much, much more sensitive test uh, than the our eye. Um, and then you can also use a PCR, a uh, PCR-based test, which mostly used in Europe. Yeah, why we want to do the MRD? Uh, it's also very, very important that, uh, so this is data from a COG from high risk a, a pre B ALL. What do you <laughs> see that, you know, all those, although all those patients, they are actually morphological remission after a month of therapy, but the MRD varies. And with the patient who has negative MRD, the outcome is great. And if you have a little bit MRD, even 0.1%, your outcome is much worse than the one that has no MRD. So clearly MRD has significant prognostic features over there. And usually after a month, uh, we will be able to tell that if the, some of those patients have really high MRD, those are the patients that maybe need to go to transplant in the first remission. Don't wait for them to relapse. Again, it's another tool for us to really know how this patient will do very, very early uh, during their leukemia therapy, and then hopefully we can have uh, some other tools to improve their survival. Okay, so the, the treatment, and um, I think it's, it's important for every pediatrician to know how we treat AL kind of in general. What we do is induction will be the first cycle of chemotherapy, usually last four to six weeks. The goal is really achieve a complete remission. Hopefully, they will be MRD negative. Uh, and then afterwards, they will do another six or nine months of intensive chemotherapy. We have different names, consolidation, intramaintenance, those are all intensive chemotherapy. Then followed by a maintenance chemotherapy, about 18 to 30 months. So generally, the ARL treatment will be long, will be a little bit two to three years. Uh, but the patients, would, they do very well uh, during the maintenance chemotherapy. <coughs> So your kids actually can go to school. They have health well. Nobody will know they ever had leukemia. Only during the induction and intensive chemotherapy, they have, they have been seen by hemonc very frequently. So how, what, what are we doing now? What are we doing? The, the main principle is called the risk adaptive therapy. Uh, what we do is based on their age and initial white blood cell counts, we're able to classify them into standard versus high risk. Then afterwards, we'll know what are their cytogenetics, and then we'll know what their response to therapy. Then we further classify them. And uh, for the very, very high-risk patient, we still uh, 
option to transplant them in the first remission, which means don't wait for them to relapse. So that's all I think you need to know about how to treat leukemia. That would be good enough for you to pass your boards for the oncology leukemia part. Okay. Uh, and then another thing we're really working on is really trying to understand the biology to define new subtypes and define new targets, which actually I'm going to give you a couple of examples uh, later. So first, risk adaptive therapy. Uh, this is our current ALL trial, and I don't expect you to remember, even I don't remember what's going on. But the key here is, based on their initial age and the Y count, we classify them into standard risk versus high risk. And then, the, to me, the most important thing is everybody will get biology samples, which means we'll take extra bone marrow, not only for the clinical diagnosis, but we save at the site and for future research purposes. Then after a month of therapy, based on their response, the patient will stay as a standard risk or they'll go to high risk if they still have MRD. For the high risk, we'll study new drugs to see if we can improve the outcome. For the standard risk, we're actually trying to pull back of some of the therapies to see if we can have the same outcome but actually less toxicity. So that's all what we're studying right now. Okay, and uh, um, next I want to give you uh, like two examples of how important it is to understand the biology can improve the outcome. So the, the first example I want to talk to you guys about is uh, some, a subtype of leukemia called the Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL. Um, maybe you all learned about Philadelphia chromosome back in the medical school. Uh, what Philadelphia chromosome is, is there's a reciprocal, a reciprocal chromosome translocation between chromosome 9 and 22. As you can see, part of the chromosome 9 breaks and also 22 break, and then you make a fusion protein right over here. Uh, so we call the BCR able, so that's the fusion protein. What happened to this is it actually it can make a protein, and this protein, because able, we call it a kinase. Kinase is a um, kind of protein that actually gives the growth signal to the cells. So the cells keep on growing and dividing, and so we call it constitutively activate tyrosine kinase. We have this signal here, the cells start to grow unregulated, and then can cause problems. And this was first discovered in a different type of leukemia called the CML, a chronic myeloid leukemia. And, uh, and then we eventually found out a small subset of pediatric, or actually ALL, <coughs> they also have this Philadelphia chromosome. So those were called the pH positive ALL. By the experience we know, the patient has pH positive ALL, they do very, very poor. Traditionally, give the chemotherapy, they only have probably 20 to 30 percent <coughs> chance of survival. They all eventually relapse. So we used to transplant them uh, in the first remission. And, uh, um, and then when people start to understand the biology, Brian Drucker, which is a brilliant physician scientist, said, if this is the signals that make the tumor cell grow, how about I develop an inhibitor? So this so-called targeted therapy, you guys probably heard reading the news, to inhibit this protein, and maybe we can treat the leukemia. This is exactly what happened. That's the development of Gleevec. So what he did is he actually developed a small inhibitor, binds to the, uh, I think it's the able part, and then block the energy transfer. Therefore, even the substrate can still bind the receptor, but there's no energy, so they cannot activate downstream target. That's why the Gleevec was approved uh, 20, 25 years ago to treat the CML. That completely changed how we treat the CML, which is the chronic leukemia. Before everybody got to transplant, now they take one tablet every day, and then the disease gets controlled. No, no transplant was needed. And since then, people said, okay, so the CML, you have this Philadelphia chromosome. P no, a subset of ALL also has this Philadelphia chromosome. Can I use this Gleevec? So we tried it. And we found out it's not that simple because it's a, an acute leukemia. Some patients went into remission, but the majority of them don't. And all they went into remission, they relapsed. Then we said, okay, so maybe this drug by itself is not enough. Let's combine with chemotherapy. So the uh, children's oncology group actually did a trial. This is what they did. What they did is they actually give Gleevec to the patient and combine with the chemotherapy. And the, the paper was published in 2009, the early outcome. What do you see? The patient actually do very well when you give them this target therapy plus chemotherapy, compared with historical control is about 
So based on this data, actually the, the Gleevec was approved to treat patients with pH positive ALL. So again, that highlight how important it is for us to really understand biology and then really develop new therapy can completely change how we treat um, a special subtype of disease. And then so this is one of the successful stories. There are many stories failed. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about another successful story. Um, again, it's called a pH-like ALL. So fast forward, and uh, probably 10 years later, uh, now it's actually almost nine years ago, there are new technology. People, they start to be able to looking, using some kind of technology called a microarray, looking for the gene expression through the one cells. You will have, you know, thousands of genes was turned on and thousands of genes was turned down. And when you use this kind of technology, they actually was able to classify the ALL into different subgroups. So the, so you, you don't need to know what those things are, and you can just see, you know, each group has similar patterns over here. Not surprisingly, a lot of time when you group them, they are based on their cytogenetics because that's gene, that's chromosome determine what the gene is on and off. But what we found very interesting is this cluster. And they all grouped together. When we, when we really look at those cases, we found out some of the cases actually they are pH AIL. They all have the Philadelphia chromosome. But some of them they don't have it, but they still cluster together. So they'll call them pH-like ALL. It they, looks like the genes, the cells behave like a pH AL, but they don't have the Philadelphia chromosome. And then not only they look in the cellular level, but also when you look at the clinical behavior, you can see that they behave actually more like a pH positive ALL. So this is the outcome for the patient who does not have Philadelphia chromosome. And this is the patient with Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL. And those patients that right fit in the middle, they actually do very poorly with conventional therapy. Even they don't like the Philadelphia, they don't have the Philadelphia chromosome. So they call it the pH-like. And then, so we're like, okay, what are those pH like? What makes them uh, to do worse uh, the compared with the non-pH or non-pH like ALL? And so this is actually a landmark paper published a couple of years ago. They were able to actually sequence all those cells to figure out exactly what changes they have in gene level in those pH-like ALL. They found they have multiple, multiple mutations. Some are actually within the ABLE kinase, and some are in the, uh, in the EPO kinase, JAK pathway, different signaling pathway. They are all, we call it, tyrosine kinase pathway. They all kind of give the growth signal for the cell to grow, kind of like Philadelphia chromosome. The, more importantly, if you clone those genes, you put them in the cell, you can see they actually grow very, very rapidly, just like the pH ALL. And if you give Gleevec, you can inhibit them all. Again, those are all in the a, in a tissue culture. So the question is, can I give Gleevec to the real patient who is pH-like? Will I improve the outcome just like what we did with the pH-positive ALL? So we actually modified our current high-risk trial. Again, all those patients will get the same induction, and we will, at the same time, we will look if they are pH-like or not. If they are pH-like, they will go to a separate arm. Everybody actually will get a design, which is a second generation of the uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, kind of like Gleevec. So they will get chemotherapy plus design. So our hope is hopefully, by using this kind of strategy, we are able to improve the uh, outcome of those pH-like AL patients uh, to the ones who does not have those high-risk cytogenetics. So by doing those kind of more um, molecular study, kind of genome-wide study, where actually was able to further classify them. So this is a, um, a pie chart that we know a lot, actually about 22% of pediatric AL, they don't have a chromosome translocation or changes. But by doing those kind of things, we actually were able to get more changes over there, further define them, and further actually uh, tailor the, the therapy based on exactly what subtype they have. And hopefully we can um, you know, make, make all those patients who have poor cytogenetic or molecular changes have really good outcome, just like the, the, good, the good players. Okay, so that's all uh, I'm going to talk about for the newly diagnosed um, ALL, how we treat them. So hopefully you, you'll get a kind of glimpse of what we were doing. You know, not only we're constantly trying to improve outcome, but also the importance of the research, how those research can actually really change how we treat the children. So I'm going to switch gear to the relapse refractory leukemia. That's really my interest 
is. And, uh, you know, even we are able to achieve, you know, our outcome of 90% cure, still 10% of patients will actually, 20% of patients will, will relapse. We're able to salvage some of them. And uh, so the way after the first relapse, uh, what we do, we give them chemotherapy, hopefully to achieve a second remission. And then, you know, hopefully they don't relapse, give further therapy. So here's what we do. And after the first relapse, if you give them another, uh, we call the re-induction, again, chemotherapy, majority of patients actually will be able to achieve a second remission. But again, the induction rate changes based on if you're early relapse or late relapse. If you have early marrow relapse, we'll know that they, those kids, they don't do well. So about 70% of them can achieve a second remission. Still, it's a pretty good number. Uh, imagine you relapse you ask, after three years of therapy, you, you relapse, we can give chemo, you still get 70% of remission. Um, but however, none of those, rem many of the, those remissions are not sustained which means they're going to relapse again. And so that's why if you look at the survival, uh, five-year survival of, uh, after the first relapse, even majority of them can have a second remission. Most of the relapse, again, you look at the survival, they're actually quite poor. And the overall survival, this is a little old data, about 10 years ago, now it's better, about 24%. Uh, again, we can actually can define by the risk by when they relapse. If you relapse really early, uh, within a year and a half of diagnosis, your survival is very poor, it's about 11%. I think currently it's probably about 20%. If you relapse late, it take, it take you three years to relapse, your outcome actually is quite decent. And also depending on where the relapse occurs. Majority of them occurs in the marrow, sometimes they occur in the CNS, sometimes they occur in the testes. Those ones that we call extra major relapse, they do a little bit better than the major relapse. Again, this highlights the, the difficult to treat relapse disease is how can you achieve a sustained remission? Because a lot often the remission will be transient. They will relapse again. Each time when they relapse, they become more difficult to treat. So because we still have a fair number of relapse <coughs> patients, in fact, COG do have a, a, a relapse trial ongoing to test some of the new drugs. Um, but um, I'm not going to talk about those because me, I really want, my interest is really using my MD and the PhD background. I'm really interested in the phase one clinical trial, how I can bring the people learning the lab to do that like first in kids clinical trials. So I'm more interested about the uh, second or third or multiple relapse patient because first relapse patient, they still actually overall, they, they are, they're not too bad. You know, we can cure a lot of them, but the, the patient who relapse two times, three times, what are we going to do? So that comes with the early phase clinical trial. And I don't want to talk too much about the trial I have done, uh, rather than I want to give you a review about what kind of challenges and opportunities we can have in this field, how to learn the new drugs. And, uh, you know, we have, there, there are a couple of issues. One, if you want the clinical trial, you need the patients. And because the first relapse patient is still too okay, for the new drug, you actually want to test on a multiple relapse patient who generally have no chance of cure. And, uh, but we are, because we're able to successfully treat most of the patient, and so we are actually limited by the, the patient number we can have uh, to do those kind of trials. So that's why we need, really need to have collaborative efforts. Sometimes we we'll do international trials, we we'll do multi-center trials. And we need to design like really, really uh, efficient clinical trials rather than using 30, 40 patients. Sometimes we're trying to just to do a trial based on 10 patients uh, to see if it can give us a signal to see if it's reasonable to move this drug further into clinical development not. And because the number of pediatric patients are small, the industry partners, they are not interested. The pharmaceutical company, because there's really no money to make uh, to, to develop a drug specifically for pediatrics, just because the patient volume is so small. So it becomes very difficult. Uh, sometimes it can be challenging for us to find the funding uh, or talk to our industry partners to give us drug for us to, to develop the, uh, those kind of trials. So we often, uh, you know, we actually lobby industry a lot. We lobby Congress, trying to ask them to change the laws to uh, promote the pediatric uh, clinical trials. And then we go to the private foundation, uh, try to get the funding for the trial. And uh, also there's a delayed access. So the, the 
historically, this has changed. Historically, um, everybody, when they talk about clinical trials in the, in the children, everybody like, oh, that's so scary. Those babies, how can you give them new a new drug to test them? So that actually limited the access for the new patient, to, uh, for the patient to get the kind, kind of new drugs. And But this has been changing just the thanks by the efforts of the other pediatric oncologists that lobby the Congress, uh, go to the state uh, legislative to lobby. Actually, uh, recently, there's a new law uh, was just passed last year. It's going to into effect in 2019. For all the oncology drugs, if uh, some adults, some pharmaceutical company, they're going into, they want to file for indication. If there is a same molecular target in the pediatrics, they have to do a pediatric oncology trial. Uh, so it's not the same disease. Like we don't have lung cancer, but if you have a mutation for the lung cancer, we have to have the same mutation in the pediatric oncology. They have to do a pediatric trial. So I think that's actually going to change, going to improve access uh, for our those uh, multiple relapse refractory patients to get access to new drug. So I'm, I'm really hopeful in the next 10 years we're going to see a lot of uh, new drugs that will go into the pediatric oncology development. Okay, so there are, so this is a, a list of the early phase clinical trial consortia in the pediatric oncology. Like I said, no institution can do those kind of trials just by them own. And so we do a lot of collaborative efforts. And I was heavily <coughs> involved with the TACO, which is actually, I think now it's a 36 institution, early phase clinical trial group. Uh, so we uh, devoted to the leukemia and uh, lymphoma. And it includes uh, US, Canada, and Australia. And um, let me think. So then I, so one of the issues with the, uh, those kind of multiple relapse trial is when you put a new drug, single agent almost never work. Like the story I told you about the pH positive ALL. You do Gleevec, just one agent never work. You always do combination trial. We give new drugs plus some chemo. But how do I know if the the new drug plus chemo, you, you had a certain percentage of a remission rate. But how do I know my, my new drug is working? And uh, always because of the chemotherapy. Sometimes it can be difficult to tell. So one of the things we try to do is we try to establish a baseline uh, you know, for the outcome of the children with the multiple relapse refractory leukemia. So let's say if I just give chemo and our, you know, your outcome is uh, your remission uh, CR rate is uh, 40%. I give a uh, chemo plus a new agent, my uh, remission rate went to 60%. So then maybe my new agent is working. Uh, then maybe uh, worth further development. But if it's still 40%, then maybe there's no reason you need to uh, further develop this new agent. So what we did is we put the tackle uh, institutions, um, we looked, um, we screened over 366 patients. They all have multiple relapse refractory pre-BALL, and we are trying to define based on how many times we relapse, what therapies they've had, and what are their outcome. Kind of establish a baseline uh, to use this as a kind of benchmark to further looking at clinical uh, development for new agents. And uh, so what we were able to see that, so here we divide the patient into the first salvage attempt, which means uh, this is the, um, when they're relapsed, we give them treatment. Second salvage is for the second relapse patient, the third and the fourth eighth salvage attempt. Uh, we're looking at the CR rate. What you can see that, um, you know, for the second relapse patient, the CR rates were still uh, pretty good at inducer CR. About half of the patient can achieve another remission. And when you have multiple relapse, the CR rate can come down. And again, this is really related with how long does it take you to relapse. Again, those are CR only. Doesn't mean you can sustain CR. Because many patients will relapse again. You see some patients actually went through eight different salvage attempts. And uh, this actually uh, is the second tackle study. We, we did one about 10 years ago. We're comparing the CR rate between two tackle study. We were act actually able to see that we actually have um, significant improvement in the patient who has multiple salvage attempts right over here and compared with second or third salvage attempt. But again, you see the trend of increase. And although small, but, uh, but it seems there's a trend over there, suggesting that, you know, with maybe introduce new agent or more intensive therapy or actually better supportive care, less patient die from the toxicity, we actually were able to make small progress uh, to treat those multiple relapsed patients. 
And、uh, so, so what what made those forced to aid salvage attempts? You know what what happened to those worst outcome? Why you see a difference? It it really we don't really don't know how、uh, why, but some of them <laughs> actually got some new therapy, which actually is、uh, immuno oncology, which is probably the the. Hardest, almost sexist therapy now in oncology <laughs> treatment.、Uh, so I, I do feel this therapy is going to change how we treat leukemia in the next couple of years. I, I, I do want to talk about、uh, those therapies. So the first therapy I'm going to talk about is actually a new drug called the blinatumumab, or you call it bite, which is very easy to remember. So this bite. Is a、um, bi-specific T cell engager. They are not really antibodies. What it has is actually it has the、um, the light chain、uh, can recognize a CD3 linked with another light chain can recognize CD19. So you got this little small molecules of proteins can recognize both CD19 and CD3. If you give to、um, a patient. And what happens? The CD19 is going to、uh, recognize all the CD19 positive、uh, drugs. Which including the pre B ARL, so the tumor cells, and then the CD3,、um, you know, is going to bind the T cells. Actually, it、um, what it happens is bring the T cells together with a、uh, pre B ARL, and then this T cells has cytotoxic T cells actually can lyse the tumor cells. So it's kind of using your own immune system to kill the leukemia cells, and it's we can call it targeted because it can target the CD19 drugs, which a lot of time will be pre B ARL, but will be normal B cells as well. And、uh, so again, the study was first done in the adults. Again, it's a shame because we do have more pediatric、uh, AL patient, but the, the company went to the adults. And the, what they,、uh, I'm sorry. Then afterwards, was done in the pigs.、So、adult paper was out、um, eight years ago. So the pigs paper was just out uh, uh, in 20 in 2016. So the, the pediatric is an international effort. They enroll patient who has bone marrow relapse. They all have pre B because T cell does not work, right? It does not have this. Uh, CD19 over there, and they all they can be primary refractory. They are secondary or later relapse, or any relapse post transplant. So they are the worst outcomers. What the, what they were able to show here, so as you can see, total is、uh, 49 patient here, and、uh, they have multiple multiple relapse. Some、uh, about 53% has refractory disease, which means they failed whatever we give to them immediately. A very very difficult to treat population. Do I have the? Sorry, I don't think I, I forgot the slides. What the ape? What they were able to show? Oh,、uh, here. So about 32% of the patient can achieve a complete remission, which is remarkable、uh, for those kind of very very high risk patients. Again, majority of them, one and a half of them, will be MRD negative. Again, which is very very remarkable. It's very difficult for us to get this kind of therapy、uh, with traditional chemotherapy. And uh, about a、uh, uh, third of them were able to go to transplant. Some of them will be the second transplant. And of course, it's not、uh, really a walk in the park. It do have some toxicities, cytokine release syndrome, and also、uh, CNS toxicity. But they're all manageable. Compared with the toxicity with the intensive chemotherapy, this、uh, toxicity actually is very very favorable. And so currently, we actually is using this drug in the first relapse. Uh, pre B A L patient to see if we can substitute with some of chemotherapy block, and、uh, because of this outcome, actually the company went to the F D A using the data present to you the baseline data for the multiple relapse tackle study. Actually asked F D A to、uh, file for pediatric indication because this drug actually was only approved for adults, not for pediatrics. So hopefully it will be approved by PEDS、um, uh, very very soon. The company has filed that. So again, that's another example to show one. There's a delay in access to the pediatric. Second is how we academic can actually collaborate with industry to actually promote how、um, you know to improve the access for the patient to get this kind of drug. And then another one, which is really really exciting, and it was just approved by FDA. It's, it's made news everywhere, which is CAR T cell therapy. It's a really funny name called Chimera, and this is a first FDA approved cell therapy、uh, for relapse pre B ALL. And this is the first patient. I think her name is Emily. I was first treated at CHOP, and this,、uh, she's now is a young woman now. She's very <coughs> well. And CAR June is the one who actually developed the technology. And、uh, again, what this drug is doing is again target the CD19,、uh, this target. 
And what it does is, is it actually take, generate a super soldiers, they call the CAR T cell, which is, I think, a uh, cancer antigen uh, related, um, American antigen related T cell. What it does is they take a T cell from a patient. So if you have somebody who's leukemia, they have pre B, but their T cells are normal. They leukophrease them, get the T cell out. They put them in a petri dish. Then they're using some kind of gene uh, therapy technology to transduce the cells. So every single T cell will be a, will express this chimeric antigen receptor uh, cells will recognize the CD19. Uh, so rather than the T cell being polyclonal, all those T cells will only recognize CD19 positive cells. Then you give it back to this the same patient. Mm -hmm. So if the patient still have some residue pre-BAL cell uh, hanging around, they will recognize all the CD19 positive cells, actually because it's a T cell, the T cell actually will grow, will multiply. So it's a living drug, if you give, you give a million cells in the patient, actually when they see the antigen, it, it can uh, multiply a hundredfold uh, within a matter of a couple of uh, days, and then will kill all those cells. So this is a very, very effective therapy. There are multiple publications. The first paper was published in 2013. Afterwards, you can see there are high impact factor journal. In fact, the most recent uh, international study outcome was just published uh, this year, which I'll talk to you about. This is the lead to the FDA approval. And um, again, what they did is they um, they enrolled the patient from 3 to 21 years. Again, this is a pediatric trial because the, actually the first paper was published in pediatric patient. And uh, with the relapse uh, refractory BAL, they have multiple relapse. And uh, they need to have some blast in the bone marrow because you need to have uh, abnormal cells there to stimulate the T cells to grow. And uh, they need to have a CD19 expression because if they don't have CD19, there's no target they can amplify. <clears throat> what they were found out is the remission rate at three months, 81% for the patient who received an infusion, which is remarkable. If you think about the data I presented to you before, for those multiple relapsed patients, you give them strong chemotherapy, our remission rate is about uh, 40%. So this actually really doubled them. And uh, if you do an intent to treat analysis, it's about 66%. I'll explain that to you. And so this looks great, but again, there's um. Clinical researcher, the devil's in the details. If you look at this flow chart, they screened over uh, 107 patients, but only 92 were able to enroll them. So there are 15 failed the screen. Uh, maybe the kids were too sick, they were not able to enroll, and they died, or they don't have the CD19, or they don't have the marrow disease. And out of the 92 were enrolled, there are 17 was not able to get the drug. Uh, so this is about 20% um, of failure rate. The reason they were not able to get a drug is one, they cannot make the T cells because you need to take the T cells out from the patient to, to, to grow in the petri dish. Sometimes the T cells just fail. And the seven died while they're waiting. This takes time for them to actually get the T cells. Uh, it's, they, they talk about three to four weeks, roughly actually it's more four to five weeks. During the four to five weeks for multiple relapse patients, many, many things can happen. So they died. And the three of them some, had some adverse events. We don't know what these probably related with therapy or with the disease. So only 75 can get the infusion. So when they get the infusion, then the remission rate is about 81%. So clearly this is a great therapy, but it's not a perfect therapy we lose about 20% of the patient actually during the waiting period. So a lot of new research is going on looking at this process, how to make this CAR T cell, how can I make it quicker, how can I make the best T cell product and uh, to, to get the, the best result. Um, so I think, but again, it is really not a walk in the park. It sounds very good. I give cells, there's no chemo, and you do great, but actually not. About every patient will develop severe uh, or life-threatening toxicity, and uh, uh, so so those are so that's why only T cells only give to some centers who are used to to do that. Okay. And then also there's relapse. How many times now? You can. Okay. okay. So then there's also again it's not a perfect therapy. There are patients relapse. They relapse. They lose the CD19. Uh, so still we need to. We still need some other new therapies going on. And the one thing we encountered is how to define the dose limiting toxicity. When you're testing a new drug, you want to make sure it's not too toxic. You want to make sure you don't kill the patient. That's the first thing we want to know. But how do I define this drug is too toxic or not too toxic? And um, so what 
couple of years ago, we've been using our relapsed uh, platform, which is the chemotherapy platform called R3, combined with new agent, uh, because that's the most effective backbone we've known so far. We said, okay, this is a great backbone. Let me add some new therapy to it to see if we can improve the outcome. So this is the five study we use this backbone. Turns out it's actually quite toxic. Those patients start to dying or have severe fungal infection. So it's hard for us to say if it's from this backbone or it's from the combination, we don't know. <clears throat> so we did a very, very small study. We just put, I called a couple of friends who we use this um, R3 platform, said, you know, why don't you do a, why don't we do a retrospective study to see exactly what toxicity are those? So we're able to actually get uh, 59, almost 60 patients. They all, they are not treated on clinical trial. We just give it to them when they relapse. And some are first relapse, some are second relapse. And uh, what we found out, you know, almost everybody has a, a severe to moderate to severe toxicities. Majority of toxicities actually was infection. Uh, the virus, fungus, multibugs, and uh, infection. And uh, what, what to me is most interesting is when we start using this backbone, we don't really know how toxic they are. So now if you guys know, like you have a new diagnosed AL, you give them a couple of days chemo, you send them home, and then they do chemotherapy outpatient. Sometimes for AML, you keep them in the hospital until they recover for a month. And so when we start using this R3, we don't know. Some places will say, oh, I keep them here for four weeks. Some places will say, oh no, let me give them a couple of days, you're fine, you go home, we'll do chemo outpatient. What we were able to find out that if you send this patient uh, home and uh, um, early within a couple of days, don't wait for a whole whole week, uh, um, whole months, almost everybody being admitted. Actually, more patients being admitted in ICU, and the result of the more chemo modification because of toxicities. And so that, that's I think this to me is the most interesting data. Actually, really show that uh, we really need to learn how to use a backbone. And also to me, it's uh, for the people who are here. I know uh, this hospital is not really like academic center, um, but if you are interested in research, those are some uh, retrospective study you actually can put together. Actually, I think has a huge impact uh, about how to take our patient about how we design clinical trial. So in fact, for this paper published now, uh, COG come up with a guideline, everybody who's getting this uh, kind of R3 backbone induction, we want to keep them in the hospital for four weeks till they can't recover because there are initial death uh, for those patients too. Okay, so I think, you know, with what I'm talking about is, you know, about our new therapy will be the CAR T-cell therapy. I think this is going to really change how we treat the patient. But the still patient will relapse, how we take it from here to the future. And uh, um, in my mind, I think not only if you see the CAR T-cell therapy is really you have a target. You design a target therapy. So how about other things like a biomarker? So this is another study I did. And, uh, you know, is there a way we can design really important study, not only test new drug, but also test the biomarkers to, to, pre to predict if some patients will respond to the therapy, some will not. So this is a study I did. We were able to identify a biomarker that's uh, for, for the patient who responded very well. And uh, you will see that this is a kind of methylation profile. You see that this biomarker, you know, if a patient is very, very low at the beginning of therapy, they will achieve the complete remission. If they are high, none of them responded. And we're actually able to verify in the different uh, uh, clinical trials to suggest this biomarker indeed is positive for, for prediction. So I think those are kind of the phase one therapies we want to move forward, really not only toxicity, but also figure out what patient will benefit. And the future trial probably will not be just design one drug, rather than you know do some kind of umbrella trial. And you, everyone has leukemia, you enroll them, you figure out exactly what kind of genetic mutations they have. And based on the mutations you have, you actually test different drugs uh, to do that, or basket trial, which is probably not going to apply for us. So I think this is going to change how uh, we really have to think how to design new trials and how to best utilize the limited patient number we have and to try to improve the outcome. Okay, so the, the future we're hoping at some point we're able to achieve 100%. Uh, some point, I'm hopeful. Okay. All right, so that's all I have. Thank you very much. Questions? <coughs> Yes. Do you think for CAR T yep. cell therapy, there'll come a time where we 
based on if the patient is very is high risk or very high risk, that we're going to leukophrease them towards the beginning of therapy just to have those T cells? Yes. Yes. In fact, the COG is developing our next ALL trials will be very, very high risk patient. Their outcome is approximately 40% by chemo only. So the trial will be we actually leukophrease them early and give them CAR T as a consolidation. But the, the issue with that is if you don't have an antigen, uh, if, let's say you have no MRD, you can't stimulate the T cells. So, so how effective that will be is way too busy. We really don't know. For the monoclonal antibodies, yep. how long you go? Great question. So the, the, the monoclonal antibody, the way it does is actually uh, 24 days continuous infusion. So during the, um, it's not a sustained. And so most of those patients, they relapse, um, you know, the medium duration of response is about six to nine months. Uh, so you really cannot use that as a consolidation. Uh, so you will make them, you know, now often what we do is we actually get them into uh, kind of MRD status, we give the antibody, give them two or three cycles, make them MRD negative, go transplant them. Uh, so can we use them in the first uh, newly diagnosed patient? We don't know yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.